Hello and welcome from Troy, Idaho. I want to give a special welcome again to my church in Endicott that is watching this uh, from there. And also today in Troy, we are reconvening live in church. So we're going to have a special family-centered program starting at 1045 right here. Today's sermon is called Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And this will be part one, so let's get into it. There's a text in Galatians 5, verse 1, and it speaks of something that I think is the foundation of what God and the church is all about. It, it reads like this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What, what does that mean? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. To me, what that means is the very foundation of God himself, his government, is based on a principle of freedom. That makes sense when you think about it, because we are free. God does not force us. He does not treat us as robots. He wants us to worship him and to choose to serve him because we respond to his love. So freedom demands love. Love requires risk. That means that if God truly grants freedom, it's possible that the people that he grants freedom to might take that to go the wrong way. But for God, his government is based on this principle of love and love is worth the risk. So he'll never force and he'll never compel. That is the principle of God's whole government. When I was in university, I had an assignment to go and interview somebody from the generation that survived the Great Depression. And this was my grandparents' generation. And so I went and I took my recorder and I talked to my grandma and grandpa in Sandpoint, Idaho. And I learned their stories of what it was like to go through the Great Depression, to be in that period of time of going through World War II as a nation. Tom Brokaw wrote a book, and it's called The Greatest Generation. And that's a descriptor of this generation that described, that, that, that went through the Depression and collectively came together to fight World War II against Nazi German powers. So as I was interviewing my grandparents about this, I saw that there was, a, I, I guess, this profound ability to endure and overcome. And, and one of the ways that a lot of people in this generation um, did this was they would collect things in case there was another trial like that. You, you might call this hoarding today. So my grandparents had a huge garden. They would collect and save everything. And people from my generation can look at that and say, just get rid of your things. Why do you need such a big garden? But the reason was, during that Great Depression period, they lived on so little. They learned how to survive, how to cook for themselves, how to make gardens and, and fix things for themselves. And they overcame together as a nation as men went to war, women stayed behind, and they went to the factories, and there was a united front against some evil powers at play. In his book, Brokaw talks a little bit about what it was like at that moment of victory on D-Day. He says this, There has never been a military operation remotely approaching the scale and the complexity of D-Day. It involved 176,000 troops more than 12,000 airplanes, almost 10,000 ships, boats, landing craft, frigates, sloops, and other special combat vessels, all involved in a surprise attack on the heavily fortified north coast of France to secure a beachhead in the heart of enemy-held territory so that the march to Germany in victory could begin. It was daring, risky, confusing, bloody, and ultimately glorious. The nation came together. They took risks. There was life lost. 
but they did it because they had a profound belief in freedom and they believed that freedom was worth protecting. As we go back to the start of the nation and the ideals that this nation was created on, we, we learn some things. And the reason that a lot of countries have freedoms today is because our founding fathers pioneered the principle of popular sovereignty, where governments answered to the people. At the time of our founding, the rest of the world was ruled by monarchs. Our founders established the first country in human history that was built by the people and for the people. It was built on an idea, the idea of human liberty. And it's interesting because as you look back on American history and you look at the first president of the United States, George Washington, he was so popular at the time that he could have been made a king, but he didn't want that because the American people had come from monarchies and they saw the destruction and lack of freedom that monarchies can bring. So George Washington, to his credit, said, no, this can't be like that. And they set up a constitution and a government for the people and by the people. For most of our history, American democracy was a global outlier. In 1938, on the eve of World War II, there was just 17 democracies. It was not until 1998, just two decades ago, that there were more democracies than autocracies. That dramatic, explosion of freedom didn't just happen. Some say it was the direct result of the rise of the United States as a global superpower. The U.S. powered victory over Nazi tyranny in World War II and our triumph over Soviet tyranny in the Cold War defeated the hateful ideologies of fascism and communism and unleashed a global wave of freedom. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And to understand we need to take a look at this term called American exceptionalism. Depending on who you ask, this can either be a really good thing or a negative thing. So let's dig into this a little bit more as we try to understand this together. The term American exceptionalism is used to describe the belief that the United States occupies a special position in history and on the global stage by virtue of certain characteristics held to be unique to the United States. This belief has undergone a number of incarnations since it developed in the 1800s, and there are both supporters and critics of American exceptionalism. Since it plays a role in political thought in the United States, understanding exceptionalism and the roots behind the idea is important for people interested in history and politics. So there are three basic definitions of this term, American exceptionalism. And let's take a look at the first one. The first one is this. The first is that the history of the United States is inherently different from that of other nations. In this view, American exceptionalism stems from its emergence from the American Revolution. Following this, it developed a uniquely American ideology based on liberty, equality before the law, individual responsibility, republicanism, representative democracy and laissez-faire economics. This ideology itself is often referred to as American exceptionalism. The second definition is the idea that the U.S. has a unique mission to transform the world. As Abraham Lincoln stated in the Gettysburg Address, Americans have a duty to ensure government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. In this light, America is seen as the shining city on a hill. The third definition is the sense that the United States history and mission give it a superiority over other nations and is even in some ways especially blessed by God. Now as I look at the Bible, I do see this aspect of God taking a people out of Europe, protecting them in a wilderness period, and then rising them up so that they can give this principle of freedom around the globe. 
Now, I'm going to zoom in on this really fast, and in subsequent weeks, we're going to dive in deeper to the study on Revelation that explains this. But in Adventist history, it is commonly expected and accepted that Revelation 13.11 speaks of the United States. It reads like this, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Again, I'm not going to go in super in-depth on this part, but just in brief, what this is describing, as Adventist historians have understood it, is that there is this nation that begins with God's protection and blessing to promote and to speak freedom. But even right from the start, there is some contradictions, even to this freedom-granting, God-fearing nation, because although it looks like a lamb, it speaks like a dragon. And as we look at the history of the United States, with all of its blessings and all of its good things that it's done, if we also have an honest reflection, it is not perfect. Theodore Roosevelt, when he was president, said this, to announce that there must be no criticism of the president or that we are to stand by the president, right or wrong, is not only unpatriotic and servile, but is morally treasonable to the American public. People that are honest and that are good leaders are going to expect that there is going to be critique at times, especially given that no person or nation is perfect. This is something that Theodore Roosevelt understood and gave permission to his people to critique. Ben Carson, in his book called America the Beautiful, says this, The question is not whether a nation makes mistakes. The question is whether a nation learns from its mistakes, builds on that knowledge it gains over time, and grows in wisdom. Those nations who learn from their mistakes will become wise, while those who repeat the same mistakes over and over, expecting a different result, are foolish. Now, as you go back to the founding of the United States and the statements from some of our early founders, you see some remarkable statements. I'll be sharing more of these in part two, but here's one from Benjamin Franklin. He says this, For when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, their local interests, and their selfish views. From such an assembly, can a perfect production be expected? It therefore astonishes me, sir, to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does. What is Benjamin Franklin saying? He's saying, whenever you gather a group of people with their different backgrounds and philosophies and religions and ideas, you should never expect a complete uniformity. There's going to be differences of opinion. And so, as he reflected on it, with the founding of the United States and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and all of these great statements, he says he was amazed that through imperfect people and differing ideas, the system was still as good as it was. Going back to the book, The Greatest Generation by Tom Brokaw, there's this story in there that I found really interesting, and I'll share it with you now. A common lament of the World War II generation is the absence today of personal responsibility. Broderick remembers listening to an NPR broadcast and hearing an account of two boys who found a loaded gun in one of their homes. The visiting boy accidentally shot his friend, and the victim's father was on the radio talking about suing the gun manufacturer. That got to Tom Broderick. So, he said, here's this man talking about suing, and he's not accepting responsibility for having a loaded gun in the house. Tom knows something about personal responsibility. He's been forced to live as a blind man for more than 50 years, and when asked about the moment when the lights were literally shot out of his eyes, he says only, it was my fault for getting too high in the foxhole. That happens sometimes. Personal responsibility. It's part of the American ethic, and it's so important 
Because if you're not responsible for yourself, then who is? That's one end of the American spectrum. But on another end of the American spectrum, we have to come to terms with some of our negative aspects of the history. 1865, that's when slavery officially ended. Then you go fast forward 100 years to 1965, and we are still in the midst of Jim Crow laws and civil right protests, and for a lot of Americans, equality had not yet fully arrived. And should we expect that it would? For a majority of Americans, of black Americans, they had just come out of slavery and there was a whole group of Americans that were not willing to grant it to them. So that there could be some inequities should not surprise us. And that's why I think this statement from James Baldwin on the other end of personal responsibility says this, I'm not interested in anybody's guilt. Guilt is a luxury we can no longer afford. I know you didn't do it, and I didn't do it either, but I am responsible for it because I am a man, and as a citizen of this country, and you are responsible for it too, for the very same reason. Personal responsibility and collective coming to terms with the history that not in all ways, has always been perfect. Tensions, and these tensions are the very kind of thing that in a freedom-granting government help us to work through the best scenarios. We need each other, and we need the opposing sides to help us to come to a more perfect union. There's this book called These Truths that I read last year by the historian named Jill Lepore. It's, it's it's amazing. And I want to read a, a, a short section here. Americans are descended from slaves and slave owners, from conquerors and the conquered, from immigrants and from people who have fought to end immigration. Jill Laplore explains that a nation born in contradiction will fight forever over the meaning of its history. Engaging in that struggle by studying the past is part of the work of citizenship. Will we hold to the self-evident truth that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Or will we fall short of the ideal and live like the founding fathers in contradiction? Now, here is the thing. As we saw from the founding father, Benjamin Franklin, he in some ways, gave permission and allowed for some contradictions to occur. This is a collective body of different political persuasions. We are never going to result in a uniformity in this nation. So that there are sometimes contradictions, I think we have to allow for that. We should always be striving for the ideal without ever succumbing to forcing an ideology. So the set of ideals and values that define American sensibilities sometimes run into one another. They pose contradictions, and I think that's okay. In fact, our ability to embrace such tensions among our ideals has actually been a key to American greatness. It helps explain why Americans have generally rejected appeals for ideolo ideological purity. Ideological rigidity doesn't allow for contradictions. Ideology requires an embrace of a doctrine, whether it's from the far left about equality or shared property, or the far right about absolute free marketism and social Darwinism. It is the tension of differing ideas that have allowed the American experiment to work. American greatness has always been one that embraced the messiness of a set of ideals that sometimes clash. Our avoidance of ideology has allowed for course correction without lurches that are perilously destabilizing. And we have cultivated a deeply ingrained sense of patriotism and loyalty to country while protecting the liberty to critique the government and its policies as essential to American democracy. By embracing idealism over ideology, we do not have to deny the contradictions at the heart of our country. Our embrace of liberty, justice, and fairness 
flies in the face of a history in which these things were denied many of our people. One of the things that I believe in most as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor is religious liberty. That means I am firmly convinced that an atheist who doesn't believe in God or going to church should always have the right to maintain that conviction. That means that a woman who wants to go to a mosque or to a temple or to a church on whatever day she is convicted to do so should be allowed to do that. Religious liberty is a protection for all. But if we ever want to have an ideology that seeks uniformity and a purity of thought where we demand everybody has to believe this way and go to this church, that would be extremely troubling. So as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, I want to protect your belief and your conviction, whatever it may be, so long as that belief and conviction does not infringe upon or hurt other people. A book that explains this well, and it's not written by a Seventh-day Adventist, it's written by a lawyer named John Inizu, is called Confident Pluralism. The whole book is excellent, but he ends with three basic ideas that he would like to promote. Inizu gives three practical suggestions that makes confident pluralism possible at a civic level. We need to be committed to, number one, tolerance. Now, this is something that can be misunderstood. That does not mean that all ideas are created equal, but it means we should be committed to respect people who have different beliefs than us. That means we need to give space for conservative thought. We need to give space for liberal thought. And we need to seek the best from both ends because as we come together with the tension of the critique of the other, we sometimes arrive at a more perfect union. So tolerance is a commitment to respect. It does not mean that we have to pretend that all ideas are equal. Number two, humility. Now this is essential because that means that I, as an individual, and hopefully a leader, understands that sometimes we're gonna get things wrong and that hopefully we need to change our perspective to alter course. Humility is actually a strength and not a weakness. And it is unfortunate that in our culture today, we've awarded dogmatism and pride with people and leaders that pretend as if they never get it wrong. But that is the weakness. Humility is the strength. Number three, patience. We all would like fast results. But when we're working with millions of people, with thousands of different ideas, it's never going to come together in a fast way. But change can't be forced if the principle of God's government is true, then that means it has to be about freedom. It has to be about a commitment to winning people over by the strength of an argument as opposed to the strength of a forced law or group pressure. Patience is the belief, as Martin Luther King Jr. quoted, the arc of justice may be long, but it bends towards justice. The arc of the moral universe may be long, but it bends towards justice. The Bible says here is the patience of the saints. We are called to hope and to wait. And as we are committed to religious liberty and freedom of thought, freedom of speech, these are the things that protect us and actually help us to create a more perfect union. So this has been Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, part one. And this place, the United States, has been a huge blessing. But let's not blind our eyes to the places where we could improve. And also, let's not blind our eyes that God says he is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And any empire, including this one, has flaws and weaknesses. And sometimes, a nation that can begin like a lamb can end up speaking like a dragon. 
Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God of love and that the foundation and essence of love is freedom. But with freedom comes risk and responsibility. On an individual basis, may we respond to your freedom and your love by giving that freedom and that love to those within our sphere. On a collective basis, May we appreciate the good things and the blessings that come from living in the United States. There are other nations that have not had the good fortune, but may we use our blessings to bless. Be with us now. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.